I actually have the pleasure of introducing someone who has a very unique insight into where all of this needs to go, what all of this means, but not only does he know where it needs to go, he can actually build it. Please welcome to the stage Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy. Have a seat. Well, first, thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. Uh, for those who don't know, I actually had the uh, privilege of speaking at one of Michael's conferences. And the topic of the day there was around business intelligence. And we've heard a lot about intelligence. We've heard a lot about insights. We've heard a lot about psychographics, all related to social media and marketing. But we haven't really talked about applications, Facebook applications. Uh, what should companies be thinking about? Why should they be thinking about? So maybe we should jump in right there. What's the significance of Facebook applications? I, th I think the extraordinary thing is that for the last 30 years, every company has spent tens or hundreds of millions of dollars gathering customer information. So there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of customer applications out there, all on a different database. It's bad data. It, uh, the half-life is 36 months. It's very expensive. A, a big company might spend $100 million a year to maintain this stuff. With the Open Graph API, Facebook's created, in essence, one database to rule them all. It's the single most significant database in the history of the world. And what most people don't realize is that, that uh, with the power of Facebook application APIs, it's likely that a million companies are all going to collapse into synchronizing their customer databases on this one database. Right, so it's the center of the universe. And if fa Facebook's collecting the single billion user uh, name directory and a single social graph, and then the most massive database of customer aspiration, affectation, uh, et cetera, and affinity, that information is equally interesting to McDonald's as to Walmart as to Target, except for the fact that instead of each of them spending 100 million to create a, a stovepipe application, now they can all share, and so it's inevitable that they will. All right, but when we look at, the, especially the open graph data, we see a lot of businesses, a lot of businesses here, taking that data and presenting it to marketers on how to better maybe market to them, how to increase engagement, what have you, but are businesses missing the real opportunity with the richness of this data? I mean, if it, if it is indeed the, the, the database to rule them all, what else are businesses able to do with that data? Yeah, well, if you, uh, if, if you look at app data, you know, the, the most successful Facebook application companies right now are Zynga and Electronic Arts, and for the most part, you see uh, games and entertainment type applications. But what leaps out at you is, is the multi-hundred billion dollar opportunity is to take that social graph and inject it into transportation and hospitality and retail and banking and finance applications. And, and uh, where it's all going to come home, I mean, where it all comes together is the smartphone application. When I download my credit card to my smartphone, the one thing I want to do is I want to pay the vendor and I want to send money to a friend. And so you need that social graph to be able to send $22 in three seconds. The next best way is I've got to type in a long email string and I might send it to the wrong one of five billion people on the planet. So, so, so mobile applications combined with uh, the Facebook social graph are going to relieve, uh, remove the friction in a lot of commerce. And, and we were just talking about sharing. I heard uh, the previous panel, what, why do people want to share things? Well, if I have a Broadway show ticket and I can't go to the show, I want to share it with my friend. And so the real killer applications are going to be send someone a $400 ticket or, or share my car key. When I open my, my car or start my car with my phone, which you can do a zip car today, the next thing is to let my sister start my car. And so, so uh, Facebook is really just scratching the surface. We're sharing photos, we're sharing news, but what about sharing car keys, hotel room keys, sharing money? Then it becomes 100x more interesting, and that's where I think the economic opportunity is in the application space. All right, but now we're looking at cross-functional I, there's, it, we're already seeing social media. I don't know for this, the, the, the statisticians in the room. Social media, specifically Facebook, lives within the organization today. It's, it's, it ranks this way. Marketing, marketing, communications, public relations. And what we're talking about is uniting the entire organization around a new opportunity, around the open graph, around the social graph. I mean, so we're talking about affecting sales, 
services? I mean, what else? And what else could you envision? I mean, ultimately, this, this, how does this impact the business? And the most powerful idea, I think, in, the, uh, in this year is the power of, of the synchronized software application network. So Facebook is a software application network. But you know, American Express could also be a software application network. And when they synchronize, if you can intertwine them in real time, then the power is to create friendly applications. And, te and I mean technically friendly, quote unquote. I mean something which is personal, social, and mobile. So for example, I, if this is a FedEx package, I can put a single barcode on it, a quick code right there, take out my phone, scan it, and say, send it to my mother. Now, you ever try to send a Federal Express package today? It's 25 fields and quadruplicate. And it's such a pain, you give it to your secretary. Now, I've got a single stamp, in three seconds it goes. And not only is it 10 times easier, it's not going to get lost. It'll follow my friend if they move to a different location. They can update their receiving address. And you can't send a letter bomb to someone you don't know. So when we talk about friendly, right, you think it's important not to get spam mail. Think about how important it is to not get anthrax in the mail. And, and there are, those applications are revolutionary when people start to realize, I can make my Letter, my, my mail system friendly, or I can have a phone that never forgets anybody's phone number again, ever. How many hours of your life do you spend typing numbers into your phone? Too right? many, too many. Hundreds of hours, and now it, it, I could throw the phone away, I get a new phone, and it reloads with all my friends' phone numbers. So uh, there are substantial opportunities to create deep, rich value into offerings. A friendly phone is a lot better. Mail that doesn't show up, you know, unexpected with the wrong thing in it is a lot better. And the same is true with a friendly credit card. If I can send money to my friend in three seconds and not lose it, that's just a lot better than, than a credit card that doesn't do that stuff. All right, well, you've used the word friendly. You have a product that is based on friendly intelligence. So for all of us, walk us through what friendly intelligence is and, and how a business can incorporate that in the workflow. Well, uh, if we start from the social graph, it's now possible to create an application, say it's a Starbucks application. You download it to a smartphone. When you download it, you link it to the Facebook social graph and someone logs in. You ask them for some number of permissions from your customer. Do we have permissions to keep track of your friend's birthday? Well, whatever those permissions are, we, we create those as a token. The token gets fed into a product, for example, we created called Gateway. Our gateway product will synchronize any two networks or any network with the Facebook network. So it'll synchronize the Starbucks network with the Facebook network on the customer tokens or the customer keys. It'll push data into Facebook. It'll pull it out. So that's the cornerstone of friendly. Once you've done that, then it, we start to, to turn the gateway on. We populate the customer database. We know who you are. We know what you like. We know where you live. And we know when your friend's birthday is. So on Tuesday morning, you wake up. You see it's your friend's birthday. The obvious thing I'm going to suggest is, would you like to give them a free cup of coffee? Would you like to give your friend a free cup of coffee? Instead of saying, you guys, you see all these crazy things on people's Facebook walls. Hey, happy birthday. I got 98 postings of happy birthday on my wall. Big deal. You're the 97th person that said happy birthday to me. A more interesting post is, happy birthday. Coffee is free on me today. Post that on the wall, deliver it by the app, and then it becomes viral because maybe I got to download the Starbucks app to get the free coffee. Right. right. The ultimate virus is money. I give you $100, but you've got to download my app to get it. So if I give away things, and in this case, a give away a birthday gift that you download to get it, that's a way for Starbucks to get new downloads and get new customers. It's a way for me to differentiate myself and show that I care more about you than just happy birthday. Right? And, uh, and money flows through the social graph. And it's impossible to do without that social graph. And so I differentiate myself against the unfriendly coffee shop. When's your birthday, Michael? February 4th. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Feel free to send me whatever you'd like. Uh, yeah, now I know. Now I know. I could be the 97th, but a free cup of coffee, I'm in. Well, how, about, how, how, about, how about 100 million free, uh, uh, it's not free, 100 million Starbucks friendly coffee gifts that require 100 million people to redeem them? All of a sudden, you've got real engagement. Right. Doesn't cost Starbucks anything. Who's thinking this way within the organization today, though? I mean, that, that's powerful. Obviously, I get it. I think everybody here gets it. Are you talking to brands because they understand that this is the opportunity that's within Facebook today? I think you see the, I mean, the forward-thinking brands, you know, the, clearly the people like the electronic arts that have been engaged. Uh, we've got a, a customer of ours, Guest Jeans, that had a loyalty card. The forward-thinking retailers are engaged. They realize the plastic card is going away. 
is going to become an application on your iPhone or your Android phone. And as long as it's an application, we might as well make it friendly, because if we plug it in the Facebook network, instead of guessing what you want, we have a perpetual unfettered right to know what you want for the rest of your life, or at least for the duration of the customer relationship until you deactivate my app, which is like corporately defriending me. Right. So if I, I, I got I to gotta not antagonize you, but if I can create that relationship, then I change the nature of loyalty. So I would say within companies, it's the progressive progressive executives that understand loyalty and how it's going to work in the social mobile sphere. All right, so let's talk about mobile for a second. For those who don't know, uh, Facebook has, on a daily basis, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 million active users. Those users are twice as active than those who access Facebook on the web. So how do you see social and mobile applications relating? I, I think mobile is, is 10 times more powerful than what we saw with the internet. I think that, that the transition we're going through with mobile paradigms today is going to be 5 billion people, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, they sleep with their software. Software is now vapor. Software is solid state in the world of the internet. I go to a cubicle, I go to my office, I run open table on a desktop, or I run my Yahoo, or I run my, my Amazon in a cubicle. Amazon in a cubicle was never threatening to Walmart because, or, or Best Buy. Amazon in your pocket is threatening to Best Buy because now the software comes into Best Buy in your pocket. I scan the television. If it's a 15 minute line to buy a television which is $20 more expensive at Best Buy, I can just go ahead and opt into the Amazon software and do it a different way. So vapor software is a very, very frightening proposition to the status quo, but also uh, software is empowered, it's unleashed you know, when, it, when it becomes a mobile form. If I'm sitting at dinner with friends, we're going to decide at dinner after whatever the main course, we want to go to a movie. At that point, we made the decision. Fandango sitting in my office cubicle is not going to get the deal, but Fandango sitting on my software, my smartphone, will actually close the transaction. And the very logical thing for me to do is say, let's go to the movie, tell my friends I'm going to the movie, send the movie ticket to my friend, right? So I inform, I share, I buy, I send money, commerce, things of value, but only because it's in my hand. Take it out of my hand and you go from, it's not like it's one tenth as good. I used OpenTable one time in a decade on a desktop. I used it a hundred times in a year on a smartphone. You're, I mean, it's obviously where we're going, but I think I need your help. I think they need your help to make decisions within the organization. Because in that one example, we've brought together three disparate organizations within the company. We brought together service, we brought together product R&D or product marketing, we brought together marketing. How, how are we going to get these guys to the table to recognize that this is an opportunity that not only that they have to do, but this is what consumers want? You know, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting challenge. You know, you've got, you've got like three types of companies right now. You've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They're, they're Amazon, right. they're, they're Google, they're Facebook, they're Apple. And they think like software companies. You've got the blockbusters. They think that like hardware companies. And you've got companies in the middle that are gradually coming to the realization that software is in their future. And they'll either embrace it aggressively or they'll be dragged kicking and screaming. But half of the economy is being remade over by these software application networks. If you think like a software company, then classic example, uh, you throw a baseball in the air, it goes 60 feet. You throw a baseball in outer space, it goes 60 million miles. People that think they're smart think that they're smart because they know baseballs go further in outer space. But a software person thinks, Cyberspace is not outer space. I can throw the baseball. It can become 10 beach balls. They can become chocolate. They can land on my front yard and convert themselves to gold. Right? Can, I, can, can I get this app today? I mean, <laughs> Any, Anything you can imagine, right? Anything in the magical world you can make. I can create a credit card which will pay, issue 10 gift certificates in one second to my 10 friends. If they don't use them within a day, it snaps them back. That's not something you would do in a physical world, but in cyberspace you would do it. And you know who will do it? It will be the Googles, the Amazons. And what we see right now is these other companies will react to it. As for how aggressively, it's hard to say. Some will fail. Some will embrace it willingly and get aggressive, mm -hmm. become the Zynga of the space, you know, where they're totally social. And, uh, and others will equivocate, and they'll consider, and they'll talk about it, and they'll watch. And at some point, there'll be an avalanche or a stampede. And then if you're not in the business, you'll be out of business. 
All right, so I'm going to use a very um, elementary example, but I, I, I'll bring it back to a question that I really need you to answer. So for example, last holiday season, consumers were going into retailers with red laser or apps like that, scanning barcodes, checking the price of, say, the Best Buy versus where it was at Amazon versus what it was at Walmart, and making decisions in the store about where they were going to make the purchase. They take that to customer service and say, look, I can get it $10 less at Amazon. Can you match the price? Best Buy says we can't because it's not an in-print ad, right? So consumers in some ways here, especially in social and mobile, are sort of leading the way for innovation based on behavior, right? And we're learning that brands may or may not be keeping up with sort of the vision of the consumer. So how do you see all of this, especially with the open graph, especially with all of that intelligence that's out there? How do you see this changing sort of the behavior and the nature of the relationship between consumers and brands? I think, uh, you know, if you look at these companies, Amazon's up 40% year over year. The rest of the retail industry is flat or down 2 to 4% on same store sales. It's pretty obvious what's happening, which is the consumers are walking in. They don't like what they see. They don't get the better deal. They just reroute the traffic or reroute their purchases to a, to a software application network or a different channel. Um, that is striking fear into the hearts of the conventional IT organizations because they don't have a monopoly on their own business processes in their own premises anymore. I think that, on the other hand, it's also a very positive dynamic because if you are a company that's being attacked by an Amazon, you have to react. And the single best way you can react is to create your own software, make it friendly, right, a and grab that open, uh, that open graph or that social graph information and use it to offer that person some benefit that they won't get from the competition. And if I know who your friends are, for example, the benefit in Walmart is I might know your friends are in the store right now, right? So Amazon doesn't necessarily know your friends in the store, and it doesn't help for them to know your friends in the store. But, but when you start to see these check-ins and, and you consider how do I compete against that disembodied red laser, the answer is it has to become intimate, which means location data, which means friend data, which means affinity data, which means that the guy in Des Moines who happens to like the local basketball team, that person could be appealed to in a very different way. I think that, uh, I think that, that many of these companies that are being attacked by the big discount shop in the sky, they're, gonna, they're going to find a way to fight back by becoming more local, more social, more personal, and they're going to use the, the Open Graph API to get there. Who within the organization is going to make that decision that this is, an, a, that this is a need? I think ultimately the CEO. I mean, at the end of the day, if the CEO doesn't buy into this, then the company's not going to succeed. And uh, you know, if you, if you look, the, again, coming back to Google, Google's probably the most profitable, most successful dot-com in the history of the world. They got 30,000 programmers, and they were so insecure last year, they fired their CEO. And so you, know, you would have to say to yourself, if I'm not as good as Google, if I don't have as much money as they have, if I don't have as much technical knowledge as they, as they have, why should I feel more secure about my future to the extent that anything I do can be impacted by mobile technology, social technology, cloud technology, or software? We've got two minutes left, and I want to know, hopefully you want to know, where's the money? Where's the money in this? I mean, obviously, if businesses figure out that they could create the app, that they could leverage the, the, the API, that they can leverage all of this intelligence coming out of Facebook or any other social network for that matter, that's a significant investment, right? So it's going to take a pretty progressive CEO, risk taker. What do they get out of it? Yeah, I guess I would say the, the world in general perceives Facebook uh, the opportunity as a new way to market, and I can narrow cast or more narrowly direct my marketing dollars. But the real, the real opportunity here, the opportunity to create a trillion dollars of value, comes by creating applications that delight the customer. The money is in the $60 billion of revenue that Amazon stole from the retail channel by having better software. Right? The, the money is in the $10 billion they took this year by having better software. If I have a hotel, and my hotel downloads an application, so I pull up Marriott, and I'm walking down New York City, and I click on it, and it says, here's where the Marriott rooms are. You want to check in? Yes. And I can put the hotel room key on my phone, and I can walk in, and, I, and it says, do you want to give a, a key to any of your friends? I say, well, let my brother in, let my girlfriend in, click, click. And then I realize, oh, well, uh, I want to change the room, change that room service, change that. At that point, they're going to steal the revenue, right? They're going to steal market share. The real money here is 
is I don't want to have to stand in line. Why do you have to check into a hotel at all? Right? Why right. Can we get a round all? of applause for that? I mean, <laughs> I want this app, Michael. And I, I think in general, right? I mean, if you can, we talk about check-ins. Right now, check-ins in Foursquare and Facebook are kind of frivolous, fun, fruity, social things to do. People say, why would I want to check in? Well, the answer is you want to check in because you really do want to check in, right? You want to check into the thing, I want, click. I want to become the mayor too, Michael. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and mayor will be good. What, you know, think about what happens when I can actually say, my birthday party's at that bar. I want my friends to go to that bar, and the bar gives me my drinks for free as soon as my 10th friend shows up. I like it, right. Right, right. so when you, when you complete social, promotional, viral marketing, I know it's your birthday, schedule your spring break trip at my hotel, and then zap that out to 1,000 people, and your airline ticket will be free, your hotel room will be free, we'll give you a $5,000 bar tab, you just gotta bring 50 friends. If I can find the guy that's the big man on campus or the prom queen, she'll get 50 friends, and then it's gonna become compelling. So bottom line is, the money comes in providing a compelling, delightful experience for the consumer that causes them to want to do business with you instead of with the unfriendly applications and unfriendly business processes. Amen with that. Everybody help me thank Michael Saylor. Thank you, thank you sir. Excellent job.